Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and as you're listening to this intro and episode, I'll be traveling England and France, eating a shit ton of bad food and putting on weight. Since I'm out and about across the pond, this saves you from a long intro from me. I'm just going to say that my guest this week, Coulter Hinchliff, is one of those few athletes that I've interviewed whose life looked like it was destined to be a professional ski bum, for better or worse. But like I always say, when you surround yourself with things you love, good things will happen. And between Alta and Aspen, Coulter did just that, and eventually he moved from behind the bar to behind the TGR lens. This one is a cool story about a dude who was and is living the ski town local's dream. And I will say that the first 10 minutes of audio is B-level on this one. Coulter was driving, and while it's not that bad at all, it gets better. And I just wanted to let you know that before you get into the podcast. And before I get into the podcast, I want to thank you for listening. I want to ask you to review me wherever you listen. And please listen to my sponsor ads and buy from them. I only work with the best brands in the business, and they are Outdoor Research, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Best Day Brewing, Elon Skis, and Stanley. Now, let's talk with Coulter Hinchliff. Your stomping grounds growing up is Aspen, Colorado, and there's a lot about Aspen that people know about. Gangs are something that people don't think about when they hear about Aspen, and they've had a little press over the years, but the gangs of Aspen are a little bit underground, and do you know the origin story of the notorious Aspen ski gangs? I don't necessarily know the origins. I definitely know there's some older ski gangs like the Buckaroos and the Dogs of Bell, and they're still around. They're just groups of older friends that get together and, and ski together, and um, it's kind of just like trickled down into our generation. And we have my ski gang, the Flying Monkeys, and then there's the Freaks, and there's the Fuzz to Grand. There's all these basically just groups of skiers call ourselves gangs and just kind of rage the mountain together. So the flying monkeys, how do you guys get that name? Do you guys ski in monkey suits? Do you go bananas in the bar? What's the backstory for your crew? You know, someone told my friend Bridget at one point that she's the only one that skis a lot around with the flying monkeys. And they were actually referencing a different gang of skiers the skier chalet boys like Willie Volkhausen and Jeff Ruger and those boys. But she didn't actually ski with them that often. She skied with us and she told us that. And we just kind of took the name and ran with it because those guys didn't love the name as much as we did. So we kind of stole the name from them and they're not quite as involved with the whole social scene as us anyways. So that's how we ended up getting the name. But since we've gotten that name, we've done our best to honor it by yeah sometimes we do wear monkey costumes and ski around the mountain and make a bunch of monkey noises and it turns out a few of us are pretty good rock climbers as well and we're a bunch of goofballs so kind of works out we're a mischievous monkey bunch you're the mischievous monkey bunch the other crew that seems to be the other dominant gang out there is the freaks and asking around it sounds like The freaks may be a little bit younger and maybe the better skiers at this point as a whole. And you guys are more like the all-inclusive kings of Apre and just like the more fun kind of crew. And they're more a ski fraternity. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, something like that. They definitely take it a little more seriously on the ski front. And unfortunately, the Flying Monkeys, we've disbanded a bit over the years. You know, we are getting a little older. People are having babies. They're stopping participating as much. They're stopping skiing as much. So that is a little bit unfortunate. But even during our heyday, I think our presence on the hill was a little bit more like having fun with it, goofing around. Yeah, a little bit more opera, a little bit more social skiing, whereas the freaks are a little bit more serious and they're the fastest skiers on the mountain. And they do have a great group of skiers, a great cast. In any sort of a ski competition, they would whoop everyone's ass. They got the rad skiers and it's fun to watch those guys ski. All right, so when I say that you're part of the gangs of Aspen, that's true, but actually you grew up in Basalt, and is Basalt pretty much like Aspen's for the super rich, then the next class of people out are the Basalt people, and then the next class of people out are the Carbondale people, or is it just Aspen's for the rich and then there's everything else? You know, it's all changing a lot in the last decade, of course, as everything is. Basalt used to be more of a commuter town for Aspen. 
a little bit more of a ranching town and it, it still is a big part of the population down valley is what what they call it we even call ourselves down valley trash and then that's coming from the heart we love it it's it's not an insult it's endearing but yeah there's a, a big part of the population down valley is hispanic which which i love i grew i went to a school with half hispanic people and it's just it's a different culture down valley but things have gotten very pricey down there as well I mean, it's got its own little economy down valley. And, and I would almost say that Carbondale is booming more so than Basalt. Although it's farther away from Aspen, it's got its own access to the mountains. It's got a, a larger area to have a town. It's got more restaurants. It's more vibrant. So everything is changing, but each town has their own distinct feel. Everyone still does commute to Aspen. That's the holy grail and where most of the money is. But yeah, everything is kind of trickling down and the Down Valley trash is becoming quite expensive trash. Yeah, I mean, well, you have to make at least seven figures to live in Aspen proper and you have to be like a decent seven figures. It can't be really low or you're going to live in just a shithole there. So you have to live Down Valley. And when your parents moved out to Basalt, did they move there because they loved the mountains as well and wanted to have that experience and raise a family in the mountains? My parents moved separately from the east coast and met in aspen and yeah they moved to aspen because they wanted to live that mountain lifestyle and when they moved down valley 35 years ago i think land was real cheap and they were just able to build a home with you know a couple of modest jobs and raise a family so i i was lucky enough to be born in the valley but it, it definitely all came from the desire to be in the mountains so are you like a second generation ski bum per se? Yeah, I would say that's true. My parents' ski bumming days began in their early 20s and they were probably over by their early 30s because they were raising families and working at colleges and owning businesses. They still ski a little bit, but you know, I'm midway into my 30s and I don't see any end in sight. It's weird. The sound in this is going to be really crazy. Are you going to be anywhere? In yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm driving. I'm pulling into a, my buddy's spot here in Jackson. Oh, um, sweet. So I'll be off this bumpy road in a few minutes, but maybe it sounds cool to the viewers. And what the hell's going on in the background there? Yeah, I don't know. People usually are annoyed when it sounds shitty, but it doesn't matter. We'll figure that part out. But <laughs> let's see where I was going to go. So like growing up in Basalt, say when you're in middle school, do you have a ski pass and can you pretty much jump on a bus and spend all day skiing Aspen and then come home at night? Yeah. Uh, my parents basically used skiing as a, a sort of daycare. By the time I was 10 or 12, they would drop us off at the public bus, me and my brother or me and my buddies, and we would just go to the mountain and ski all day and then take the bus home and they'd pick us up. And we had fun and we were out of their hair, so it all just worked out really well. And I feel like my skiing style kind of shows that in a way. I was never in a structured racing program or freestyle or anything. I was out just skiing and having fun and using the whole mountain. And sure enough, I got into the park skiing because it was, you know, that revolution of free skiing happened when I was 15, 16 years old, maybe even a little younger than that. And so it was called the snowboard park before that. And when we first started poaching the snowboard park a little bit and then getting let into what became the terrain park. It was a really fun time in skiing and really exciting. And, you know, JF Cousin and JP Claire and Steel Spence and everyone was revolutionizing the sport doing, you know, mute grab 360s and flares and all of those things that we were all just trying to emulate. So that's kind of where my skiing began and where it evolved. And then I ended up moving to Alta, Utah. You're getting way ahead of ourselves. Oh, yeah. Sorry. It's all good. I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit. So you get into park skiing and say like 2000-ish is when the X Games moves to make the new home of the X Games at Aspen. And you're like 13, 14 years old. Is that mind-blowing that the biggest event in skiing is coming to your town every year for the next 10 years or whatever? Were you super stoked? Yeah, I was really stoked. I went to those first X Games in Aspen and I remember like really distinctly standing at the bottom of the slope style course and watching Candy do some crazy stuff and didn't realize it. But then I looked over and I was standing right next to Sarah Burke and I was a huge fan and I was just like so like starstruck and excited that I was, you know, seeing these people in real life that I had only seen in the movies before. So it was a really fun little period. 
for a while there. And now, to be honest, I get out of town when the X Games come nowadays because it's such a big show and it's rad. And I love that it comes to Aspen, but it's one of those things I avoid nowadays, but I loved it when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, when you were in full Grom mode, like who were the skiers that you had on your wall that were like the people that you idolized? Yeah, I mean, it was like Sage and Seth and JP. It was kind of that cast. And then like Micah Black, he caught my eye at a young age. And I think I, I've taken a lot from those guys. And that's the way that I still try to ski. Not necessarily thinking of them, but it's just kind of the way that I developed my skill set and my desire to be out there was to be well-rounded and, and have fun and be playful. But at that point in your life, when you're focused on park skiing, I'm sure when it's a pow day that you're going and hitting whatever you can and dropping whatever's possible at Aspen. But a lot of times you're spending in the park and are there park skiers that you're stoked on too? Like, were you thinking about competing in park? No, I never really. I mean, we had a couple big air competitions, local ones that I would get into, but I was never focused enough. It was always just this fun. Let's go skiing on the weekend. Like, oh, let's hit some jumps. Oh, you did a, a backflip. I want to try one. It never was competitive for me. But I think I was always really drawn to film. And I kind of always wanted to go that direction. And I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe it's because I was watching it and just thought it was really cool. And now I love the whole process of filming. I love the art of it. I love getting together with a crew and spending time in an area. And like, I'm always searching conditions, you know, conditions are paramount. I need soft snow to, to do what I do. So yeah, I never ended up going the competition route or having really any desire. Instead, it was always film. Okay, so I'm going to take it back to the X Games. They would come in town. You were probably all over running around with the crew of kids. Were you ever sneaking into parties and scoring free shit and living it up like you should have been at the X Games? Not so much parties. I mean, I was young. I was 16, 17 probably when those things were coming around. But the free stuff, it was so funny how much it would mean to us to get just like a free koozie or like, I remember this one time there was like a a cologne sponsor and somehow we got our hands on like a couple boxes of like some stinky cologne that we hoarded and brought them all home and like stacks of Fiji posters. I remember I had in my room at one point. So yeah, we were always looking for those freebies and it's kind of funny thinking back on that. You have so many different events. It's not just the X games. Are there a ton of different free concerts and shit that you got to see when you were a kid? And what's like the highlight of that? Or not even a kid, just like throughout your life. Yeah, I mean, nowadays I enjoy that stuff more. I love that Aspen has a lot going on. I was out of town this last weekend and they had the World Cup and they had a bunch of free concerts in the town park. And it's just so cool that they do that for the community. There's always something going on. It's really fun and I enjoy it now. But growing up, I was living down valley, down valley trash. I was I was on the bus at four o'clock after skiing. So that wasn't really a big part of my life growing up but it is now it's something that i really enjoy okay and then thinking of you and your friends growing up and skiing everybody's good in aspen did you go to school with kids that were like already sponsored when you're like a sophomore in high school aspen had that culture a lot more so than basalt did Um, basalt has pumped out a lot of really good skiers over the years like travis red was someone i grew up with so to answer your question yes he was one that i looked up to he was in level one movies and There was a snowboarder, Drew, who was around. But I think Aspen had a lot more of that with like the Steel Spences. And Peter Olenek and Michael Olenek were around a lot as well growing up. They're further down Valley Trash than I am. They're from Carbondale. Okay. Uh, So yes and no, but I think Aspen really kind of pumps them out a little bit more directly than Basalt. Did you have any good friends that lived in Aspen proper where you could just hang out at their house and kind of use it as your little ski getaway? No, I didn't. I did end up having friends like in high school and stuff that we would go up and party with. I had party friends up there, but we wouldn't be able to stay with them because, again, you're in high school and they lived with their parents. And we would just take the two o'clock or after bus home and make our way to our parents' house was the way it worked. And we did connect with the Aspen kids that way, but not so much from a ski bumming standpoint. So I'm going to fast forward it to way later in your life just to get some more Aspen questions out. And not only is everyone a great skier in Aspen, but there's a lot of people that are really wealthy. 
You eventually tend bar at the Red Onion, which is like the go-to spot at the time in Aspen. And between like high school friends, ski friends, and bar friends that you meet working at the Red Onion, what's the coolest rich person shit that you've ever done in life just because you're from Aspen and met somebody who had some shit going on? Yeah, there's a few guys in Aspen that are still around. Um, I've actually become better friends with them lately. Wealthier, older gentlemen that love the ski bomb vibe in town and they do their best to hook us all up and bring us on trips. I've been on a couple private jets to go actually to like baseball games. One of the guys, Andrew, I hope he doesn't mind to say his name. He's super generous. He throws epic parties in Aspen every New Year's Eve. There's a party. Fourth of July, there's a party. Everything's catered, open bar. It's so much fun. He owns the Tampa Bay Devil Rays and he's flown us out to some games. And it's just stuff like that that's really kind of these fun, unique opportunities. I also do have another friend who has his own airplane. He's a click down on the wealth scale, but he owns his own airplane, not a jet, just a turboprop. And the original way I met him was through my boss at the Red Onion because he's always looking for someone to go on these trips with. And he was going to Alaska. And my boss was like, hey, you're fired. Do you want to go to Alaska with my buddy Jason? And I got fired because I trashed the bar the night before. <laughs> Still very good friends with that boss and did end up going to Alaska the next day with his friend Jason, who's still a good friend of mine. So there are these funny opportunities that pop up that are only in Aspen type things, but they're still focused around what we love doing, skiing and having a good time. Now it's time for my first sponsor break, and I want you to buy all of your ski and snowboard gear from Peter Glenn Ski and Sports. Why Peter Glenn? Well, first and foremost, they're the little guy who's been getting people out on snow for over 65 years. They aren't trying to take over an industry by making a ton of branded products that compete with the brands they already sell. They're not trying to get you to stay at a hotel or sell you a vacation. Peter Glenn is about making sure you purchase the right products to ensure that you're going to have the most fun on the hill. And they have all the brands, all the products, and incredible deals both in-store and online. While other retailers focus on algorithms and AI, Peter Glenn is all about having the most knowledgeable staff that understands what you need. And if you've been following them on Instagram, They've been dropping some incredible pro tips that will make your time on the hill more enjoyable. At the end of the day, people have trusted Peter Glenn since 1958 because of their proven track record and all-around passion for snow and beyond. So if you ski, snowboard, inline skate, wakeboard, water ski, or need outerwear for your adventure, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports is your one-stop shop, and they offer free shipping on orders over $50, a hassle-free return policy, and they price match reputable dealers. So please support this podcast and buy your stuff over at peterglenn.com. Next up, it's Elon Skis. I started telling you about Elon building a cult following in the States about three years ago. And if you're like me and heading up to the mountain on a weekly basis, I know you've been seeing more Elons. There's a reason for that. People who ski Elons notice that skiing on award-winning products made in what is considered the best factory in the world will make them a better skier. The product they put into the marketplace is second to none. I mean, Elan's a company that also makes luxury yachts, and they don't cut corners on materials or production. The difference in quality is noticeable. Walk up to any ski wall and compare the craftsmanship of an Elan ski to everything else on the wall. You'll see a difference in the fit and finish, but the most important difference is how they'll perform on snow. That's why Elan's been winning a ton of awards at the magazine test, because they really do ski better. If you want to have more fun on the mountain this season, get on an Elan. You can find out about all things Elan over at elanskis.com. My final sponsor this round is Stanley. And if you haven't been hearing a lot about Stanley lately, you must be living under a rock. They've absolutely blown up in 2023 and everyone is talking about them. I've been telling you about how incredible their products are at keeping your drinks hotter and colder than anyone else's for about seven years now. I mean, they invented the category in 1913. And while they always have done well, the world now knows that if you don't have a Stanley, you don't have the best. And I love having the best. Personally, I use Stanley pint glasses every single day. And I swear by them. And my wife and so many others can't live without their Stanley quenchers. And recently, I've integrated Stanley food storage devices into my ski routine. Instead of buying $20 burgers, we bring our food to the mountain and it stays piping hot in our Stanleys. And I end up saving about $70 a weekend not buying food. While that's rad, what's even radder is that Stanley offers Powell Movement listeners their biggest discount that they make available to the public. I'm going to save you 30% on all your Stanley products. Here's what you need to do to get that discount. Head on over to Stanley1913.com, 
go shopping, and at checkout, enter the code SNOW30. That's all caps and the number 30 with no spaces, and you'll save that 30%. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Can you describe what the scene is every day at a place called Cloud9? Because I've heard of it. I've seen a couple videos. I've never partaken in it. Have you ever been there? And can you describe what a waste and probably how awesome it is all at the same time? I hate it. And a handful of, I would say it's, it's got to be about 50-50 people that hate it and people that love it. It's basically a timed party. It's not authentic whatsoever. You go in and you have 45 minutes to sit down and eat your raclette and fondue. And then they turn the music up at 45 minutes on the dot. Everyone stands up on their table, starts dancing on the table and spraying champagne all over the place and on the ceiling. The last time I was there, the cheapest bottle of champagne you could buy was $100. And people were just popping them and spraying them all over the ceiling. You know, it would last about five seconds. And if someone else is paying, I guess it's kind of fun, but to me it's so contrived it's such a waste i don't love being soaked in champagne i had a girlfriend that like wanted to do that for her birthday and i had to leave a sick powder day to go do that and i like am in all my nice gear and i had to like stash it in the corner so that i didn't ruin all my gear and have to ski down soaking wet so it's kind of ridiculous but i can see why people think it's fun i mean dancing on tables and spraying champagne is a good time To me, it's just a lot more fun if it's something that comes about because the vibes are so great, not something that you're timed and orchestrated for you. Yep, it's totally manufactured. And when you live in a ski town and you're a kid, especially coming up, you see adults partying their faces off. You see people smoking weed and I'm sure other shit. And you see all that at a really young age all the way through high school and whatever. When does that lifestyle start with you? I mean, I know that first and foremost, life for you is about skiing. There's no way to put into words how much you love skiing from everybody I've talked to. It's like, well, that dude just loves skiing. He loves to ski. But with loving skiing becomes a lifestyle of apre and partying, especially when you're younger. And do you get into that at a young age? Again, I was so isolated from Aspen. Aspen to me was a Raptabus ride, go skiing, get back on the Raptabus and drive home. So I was never really exposed to it at a young age. I remember one time I went to like a very casual dinner party with my parents and when we drove back down it was up near red mountain much more humble estates above smuggler but if you've been to aspen you know where red mountain is it's got a beautiful view of town and i remember being in the car ride home and looking down at town glowing and i think it was a full moon and the mountain was lit up and i remember like feeling it like wow look at that place what's going on down there like i remember that But that didn't expose me to any of the illicit drug use going on or the raging parties. I didn't really experience any of that until after I dropped out of college and moved back to Aspen and and really dropped into the ski bum life there and was like, whoa, this is fun. Yeah. Well, let's see. So high school ends. You end up going to college. I think it's Mesa State. And I think they've changed their name or something like that. But you end up going there. And is that just because you thought that was the track you needed to be on, like graduate high school, go to college and then get a job and have a life? Is that why you went that route? It's funny that you know that I went to Mesa State. You've done your research. And yeah, that's exactly why I went. It was societal pressure, I would say. You know, you're getting to the end of high school and everyone's like, where are you going next year? And I was never a great student because I was not really that interested in it. I did well enough, but I was never like top of my class or anything. So I went to Mesa State because it was cheap and right down the road and easy enough to get into. And I had a great fall semester. And I'll never forget coming home for Christmas, skiing all Christmas, having so much fun, and then having to go back to college and realizing like, wow, I actually made the choice to do that all of my life. I would have killed to not have had to go to school throughout high school and just be able to go skiing. And I chose to go back to Grand Junction to go to college. What was I doing? I won't do this next spring semester. And so that's what I did. I went the third semester would be the fall semester. And I took the rest of the winter off. And I worked at Incline Sports as just a rental tech. And I think I moved into a place in Aspen at the end of the winter and just kind of got to like realize what's going on up there. And I never went back to college. 
So you go back to Aspen and you work the rest of that season there and you realize how amazing life as a ski bum is. And or not, I mean, I use ski bum liberally as like, you know, but that's kind of what you're doing. And at this point, a lot of shit is popping off in Utah, like in the ski industry, tons of stuff was happening. There was Olympic stuff in the Park City side. Then you had the big mountain free ride kind of stuff in Little Cottonwood Canyon. Did you see that and realize that it was time to get out of Colorado and, and head to the mountains of Utah? No, it was entirely based upon my winter job that season at Incline that I just mentioned. There was a guy there, Steve, who actually had lived in my parents' mother-in-law unit when I was younger, so I knew him. That was how I got into Incline, and he had moved into my parents' house from Alta, Utah. And me and my really good buddy who I was working at Incline with were questioning him in the back one time about alto like what's alto like anyways and he's like it's like the wall but all over the whole mountain and they get way more snow and both of our jobs (laughs) dropped and we like made a pact right then and there like we're gonna move out there next year we're doing it he had just gotten back from college he's a little bit older than i am and we did in september we drove out to salt lake applied everywhere we could even down in salt lake city up in brighton solitude out the snowbird and as fate would have it, Alta Peruvian Lodge was the first people to call me back. And they offered me the gift shop job, which is a pretty cushy job. And I was like, I would love it, but I'm coming out there with my friend. You have a job for him? They're like, yeah, we have a spot open in laundry. You can have whichever one you want. And I was like, which one's better? I'm like, well, gift shop's way easier. But laundry, you can ski a lot more. So I took the laundry job and gave Andy the gift shop job. And we moved out that November. Yes, skiing was never the same ever again. When you take a job at the Peruvian, for those that haven't been there, can you kind of describe that place? Because it's got a charm that like every ski bum should experience at least once. School Lodge, I think it was built out of military barracks that were up there, I don't know how long ago, 50, 100 years ago. And my experience that when we first moved there in November, we drove up the canyon in a blizzard and pulled into the parking lot. and went in and they're like, oh, we'll show you your bunks. And they brought us to what's called the fort. And it's just employee bunks above the garage, basically. Yep. And we go up these rickety stairs and it just smells like stale beer and weed. And the door opens into the fort and it's just lined with ski lockers and ski gear. And there's weed smoke in the air and reggae music down the hall. And they show us your room and it's a tiny room with two bunk beds so they have to house all of their employees because they get so much snow up there they can't rely on their employees making it up the canyon every morning and they paid us i'm pretty sure eight hundred dollars a month but free room and board and a free ski pass so you got nothing to do but eat sleep and ski you don't have enough money to do anything else and that's all we needed to do And we high-fived each other right when we stepped foot into our room, like, this is the best thing we've ever done. And it really was. I ended up spending five years there, and they're the best five years of my life in a lot of ways. Working at the Peruvian, that is a spot where every local kind of goes through for at least a beer, at least a couple times a season. Do you pretty much meet the whole Utah ski scene just through working at the Peruvian and then skiing with people? It was like the Peruvian family. I pretty much stuck within the people that I knew from there, because there's plenty. You know, there's 30 or 40 employees that are all kids your age that just moved there. And then, you know, there's some older guys that have been there for a little bit longer that kind of show you the ropes. And so you have a closed network of people that is all you'll ever need. But yeah, the the Peruvian is a classic spot. It's sort of like everyone's favorite bar is the Peruvian and it's very approachable. They let people come and go. And so, of course, we did end up meeting, you know, Hayden Price is someone I met who was like one of the younger pro skiers back then. And then I was starting to have my dreams of becoming a pro skier when I got there. I was getting better and like hungry. And I did just start walking up to photographers. Like I just walked straight up to Steve Lloyd probably five different times. Like, hey, Steve, I'm Coulter. I want to go take photos with you sometime. I got what it takes, man. I promise. And he laughed me off a few times. And I think I hit him at the right time once when he was a little desperate because he really wanted to get this night shot. And he's like, all right, well, meet me at the bottom of the canyon tonight at six o'clock. We'll see how it goes. And right away, he was like, oh, this kid can actually ski. 
And Steve's an amazing photographer. And we just began a relationship then. And I was in Utah two weeks ago and we missed each other. But yeah, those relationships are still going on with the skiers and the photographers and the Peruvian. I still stay there when I'm there. So it's lifetime relationships there. And so I read a quote of yours somewhere that said something to the effect of, you have to make opportunities happen and then maximize them. And when you think of that, is that why you're going and not harassing Steve, but you're going up to Steve and being like, hey, will you shoot with me? I think Eric Hostetler was another one. And then you start entering free ride contests. Were you just trying to always do something to keep whatever thing you had going in skiing moving forward so you could kind of get some traction? Yeah, and I think I still do that. Currently, I'm in Jackson Hole. And I, last week, I was sitting in Aspen and having a great time being home. I had been gone all winter and it was super nice to be home, but it was snowing up here in Jackson and this is where TGR is. And, you know, my best thing I do every year is film with TGR. And I was like, I'm just going to go up there and ski and, and you know, see what, what I can get into. And sure enough, we're filming now and I'm here for another week filming, which is great. And that's exactly what I was doing back then. I was just cold calling people and trying to make things happen. And I don't know what my drive is, but I think it, I just wanted to make this life a reality. And I feel quite lucky that it's worked out so well. Well, I mean, the way that you've done things and how you've lived your whole career is like, you don't book plane tickets a month out. You do it three or four days out and you're chasing POW and it's like, you're not going to waste a trip anywhere. So every season, pretty much, you're going to have the luck of getting the weather correct because it's not like you have a wife or kids or anything that you have to worry about. It's just like you are kind of dead focused on making sure you get POW days. Is that pretty accurate it's like you know me or something yeah it's very accurate first thing i do in the morning is scroll through my weather app and i look at europe i look at colorado wyoming canada japan look at everything and i just keep trying to put myself in the right position and it takes a lot to line all this stuff up and people don't realize that i love to kind of say this that people watch a ski movie come fall and they see someone do something and half the people in the crowd are thinking or even saying to themselves, I could do that. And the truth of the matter is they probably could. There's a lot of good skiers out there. But putting yourself in that position with good light, good snow, cameras pointed at you and then performing is that's the tricky part. You know, finding yourself in the right position with good snow on the resort and being able to ski well. A lot of people have that ability. And that's, I think, why everyone can resonate with what they see in a ski movie. But putting it all together is a true challenge. So you're trying to do stuff to put together a career. One of the things you do, you and Eric Hostetler win a best powder and a grand prize in a North Face photo contest. When you win a photo contest, when you win anything, when you're coming up and have a dream, I'm sure you're stoked. But what do you win from that? Do you know that this is a conflict? Because it is. And I will throw Eric right under the bus. It pissed me off big time. I didn't even know that he had submitted any of these photos. I was actually in Silverton on like one of my first commercial shoots ever with True Gear, a new sponsor of mine. I was super stoked. And I come back to service and get all these messages. Whoa, dude, you just won like the grand prize and the other prize. You're winning everything. I'm like, what are you talking about? So in the end, Eric had submitted a few photos to some sort of photo contest and I'll never forget how clearly it was written in the rules that each of these prizes, because it takes a photographer and an athlete to get these images. And in the end, we won, yeah, like a North Face duffel bag, some other nondescript gear that I can't remember. It could have been pairs of skis. It was nothing small and a trip for two to go heli skiing in Canada, which I'm 20 years old at this point, had never been heli skiing or anything like that. And I like call bro, his nickname was bro at the time. And I'm like, dude, that's so sick. We want all this stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, dude. Oh yeah. Um, cool. Well, like, dude, I did all the work submitting it. So I'm going to like bring my wife heli skiing and I'm going to keep all the gear. In the end, I threw a little bit of a fit, even posted something on a forum. Cause I think it was through Teton gravity forums way back then, which were really a popular thing. And People got a little upset. In the end, he ended up giving me the North Face duffel bag, and that was it. And I just thought it was so distasteful and such a slap in the face, and he was such a douchebag about it, to put it bluntly. I've never forgiven him. He's reached out since and maybe said, I'm glad your career is going well. I hope you're doing all right. But it, it was so low, I'm still bitter, and I always will be. 
unfortunately. Well, I didn't know I was going to get that kind of answer, but I did. And that's crazy. And then you enter the Subaru Freeride Finals at Snowbird, and you get third place there. So things are going great for you, it seems like. But they don't do much for a ski career by any means. It's like you're making a couple things happen, but nobody seems to notice that much. Is that why you moved back home to Aspen? Because you've put a lot of time in in Utah, and you're not really making anything happen for yourself? Not the way I remember it. I don't remember those competitions being... The only reason I did them is because I was living in Utah and they came through and I was like, well, fuck, people are competing. I want to I want to be out there. And I had to kind of like beg and scratch and plead my way in there. Jim Jack, rest in peace. He was awesome and helped sneak me into a couple of those last minute. But I, I never looked at those as a as a real stepping stone. I don't think I was never trying to go that direction anyways. It was more just like, wow, they're here. I want to try. And I remember I had one really, really good outing on Silver Fox. I ended up crashing at the bottom. And someone was just talking about it when I was in Utah last time. I had already had the best run of the day. And then I tried to squeeze in a flat spin at the bottom and I crashed. And if I hadn't, I would have been on that podium or on the top of the podium. And we were talking about how that could have changed my whole career. And maybe I would have ended up being more of a competition skier. And the competition scene is rad, but it was not for me. So I'm, I'm glad it didn't go that way. By the time I moved back to Aspen, I thought I had already made it a little bit i can't remember the timeline it almost seems like you've got it more pinned down so you moved back to aspen in like 2011 i feel like and right when you get back there i think is when the powder cover comes out the powder cover was the big break that's what i always remember it's time for my final sponsor break and i can't tell you how much i love my gear from outdoor research when i signed on with or i knew there wasn't an outerwear brand on the market that performs as well as what or is developing That's what happens when you test your gear in the absolutely terrible conditions that we can get here in the Pacific Northwest. Days in the mountains are always more fun when you're warm and dry, and I know my OR gear will always deliver that. I'll tell you, on cold days, I live in my cold front hoodie, which is hands down the warmest and most stylish puffy I've ever owned. And then when I get on snow, my snow crew jacket and pants are not only warm, but it's one of those fits where, if you don't see me ski, I look like a pro. I'm so impressed with the style that OR has been bringing to the table lately. And off snow, they sent me some Ferrosi pants, which are now my daily drivers. Think stylish, lightweight, packable, do-anything pants with the right amount of zippered pockets and stretch to be the only pant that you'll ever need. I've been loving OR products since I bought my first OR rain jacket in 2000. And really, if you missed out on using my old discount code for OR products, well, I'm working on getting you a new code, but I can't promise anything. Sometimes you snooze, you lose. So check back for that. And in the meantime, head on over to OutdoorResearch.com and check out why they're one of the fastest growing brands in snow and beyond. My final sponsor this round is Best Day Brewing. If you haven't heard of Best Day, they are hands down the best tasting non-alcoholic beer on the market. I enjoy Best Day for so many reasons. The flavor is the most important. I swear by the Hazy IPA, the Kolsch, and the Belgium White. They all taste just as good or better than their alcoholic cousins. And I'll tell you, while I haven't quit drinking, when I go to the bar... After three or four beers, I usually feel like it's time for me to head home, and everyone thinks I'm lame. But lately, I have a new routine. I'll have a best day every third beer, and it makes my night last twice as long. And we all know, lasting longer is better. If you want to have your best day or night ever, or just enjoy a few cold ones at Apre, grab a best day, and you can forget about the calories, forget about the alcohol, and forget about getting in trouble on the way home. To see all the flavors and order some beer, head on over to bestday.com. And if you're flying Alaska, you can now get a best day Kolsch at 30,000 feet. Those are my sponsors. Now let's get back into the podcast. I think you were back in Aspen. You had already moved from Alta back to Aspen. You're only in Aspen. I don't know if it's like a month or whatever, but I think the powder cover comes out pretty soon after you get back to Aspen. And when that comes out, did you have any idea you were getting a cover or is it kind of like just total surprise and like your stoke meters through the roof? It was a total surprise. So it was in the summer. So I always moved home for the summer for the most part. I I never stayed in Utah in the summer. So either way, I was home for the summer because we were backpacking up near the Maroon Bells and we came out and we were riding that Rafta bus again. And I came back to service and Mike Rogge sent me a picture of the cover and he said, your first powder cover. And I was like, so jacked. And I still love that photo. That was another Steve Lloyd shot. That shot in particular was funny because it was kind of my vision. I was bugging him to come shoot it. I was like, we could shoot it with a light while it's snowing. It'd be so cool. And 
he was kind of grumbling. He was going through some stuff in life and we ended up going up there and he's like, I'll take one picture and see how it is. And he took one picture. He's like, can you do it again? <laughs> can you do it again? Can you do it again? And we just nailed it. And I love that photo. And uh, it's sort of like a lifetime achievement to end up on the cover of Powder, especially back when it was a really big deal. Instagram wasn't a thing and print media was not dead. And it was a huge moment in my life. So that was definitely a highlight. And that opened up some doors. I remember Smith sending me a little money as like a thank you, a little bonus money. And that was the first time I was getting money from people. But I, I was already skiing for line skis. I, don't, I think that was through Steve Lloyd as well. Yeah, because he was working with them for a while. He was, yeah, but I don't think I was getting money yet from those guys. They saw your cover, and your cover was pretty much a line ad. And it was at a time when Line was looking for some big mountain freeride guys. And that cover timed with you working with Steve was like the perfect opportunity for you to hook up with Josh. So that cover comes out, you get the bonus from Smith, and I'm sure they're li lining up to sign you up. And then does a phone call come from Josh, and you get a contract with Line, and that starts your six-year run or whatever that is with Line? I can't remember these specifics that much, but I had to fight tooth and nail to get anything out of line when I did get it. Oh, I can imagine. I worked for a company that owned them and uh, everybody had to fight for everything that they got from those companies. Yeah. And Josh, Josh helped me out, but Jason Leventhal believed me much more so than Josh. Josh is very focused on the free skiers, Tom Wallish and those guys. And those guys are great. Don't get me wrong, but he was very focused on them. And I felt like the black sheep the whole time. And I felt like every year I would come in the fall and be like, look at all the shit I did last year. And he'd be like, all right, we'll sign you again. But it was one year, one year, one year, one year. I never had a multi-year contract with them. And the f one year I got hurt, I got clipped. Like it was like the first year I didn't get anything done. It was over. So there was a little bit of love lost there for me. And Leventhal had been gone by then. He had moved over to JA Skis. But he was the one in the beginning who was going over Josh and be like, yo, sign this kid. We want him. We like his style. He's big mountain. He's what we want. So that's how that'll happen. But I can't remember the exact specifics of when and how. And I think the TGR thing might have even happened before I really started getting paid with line. It did. And we're going to get to that. But you'd already been on True. And the way that that deal came together was kind of interesting. It wasn't like, like they sought you out or you sought them out. You guys kind of met on a mountain. Is that pretty much how that intro started and then you guys worked out a deal from there how do you know all this stuff bro? that's my job man it's crazy yeah while i was living in alta utah i would still go home occasionally to aspen over the holidays and i think this in particular was over the holidays and i was hiking highlands bowl epic everyone should do it and i had brought a friend home from alta my buddy from maine pat chamberlain Super stoker, rad dude, just so stoked on skiers. I remember when he first arrived in the fort, he comes into our room. He's like, what's up, guys? I'm Pat. Are you guys rad skiers? You guys send it 70? I bet you send it 70. And it was sort of like a funny thing we always quoted him on. Send it 70, bro. Anyways, he was with me on this hike. And I was like, whoa, look at those jackets. Those are cool. That thumbs up. That looks pretty sick. He's like, go talk to him, dude. Because I'm, I'm a little more shy than you, you think. Sometimes people think I'm a dick because I don't want to make small talk or I don't know, but I'm just a little like a little more introverted than you'd think at times, especially. I was kind of nervous, but he kind of pumped me up and I, I went and talked to these true guys and they've since become some of my really good friends. And, and I miss true gear in a certain way because I love the Pew brothers and trip. They were formative in my life for sure. And yeah, they were like, yeah, check it out. It's sick we're traveling around in this RV. And I was like, oh, well, I live in Alta. If you guys come through, they're like, we're going to be there in a week. We'll hit you up. And I was like, okay. And when they came to Alta, they were like, here, try some of our stuff on and let's go rip around and we'll take some photos. And they were like, whoa, this kid's kind of sick. We're going to leave an outfit with you. And I was like, okay, sick. So that was kind of my first free outerwear. And then they came back to Alta two or three weeks later and I got in the RV with him and we drove all the way up into Canada, which was my first experience in Canada in this RV. And I mean, we were having the best time ever. We were skiing and we were operating and they were paying for things for me. And that was one of the most fun trips I've ever had in my life. Awesome. So you get on True, you were on them for a while. So it was like you were on True and Line for a long time. You're not on either brand anymore. You said love with Line, you got hurt and you got let go. And then you did like a one-off ski with Folsom that kind of looked like a line Piscato. 
that was just kind of to tide you over until you found a real sponsor. You eventually signed with Vocal, who's your sponsor now, I believe, and they're great. They can pay the bills. What happened with True? Because you were with them, and in the beginning, especially like in the very beginning, it was like rocket ship growth, it seemed like, and those guys were crushing it, and then there's a lot more brands got into the clothing game, and eventually you got off True, and now you're on Backcountry, I believe. What happened with the whole True relationship? I'll just correct you on one thing there. I never had anything to do with Folsom. Folsom did a collab with True over this Powfish jacket that I helped design that was like a swallowtail jacket. Okay. So I never actually skied on Folsom, but they did a collab and I was associated with the jacket. So I can see why you got there. But what happened with True was kind of along the lines of, of that powfish jacket that i was involved with there wasn't enough of that going on first of all i had tons of feedback i'm like a little bit of a gear nerd the pants i have on right now that i'm wearing i'm sitting here wearing i have five different modifications on them and they're not things that i'm upset with they're things that i'm like what if we tried this i think it'd be really functional and i thought that being with a small brand like true would have allowed more of those ideas to come to life but they never did. And so that was a little bit of a bummer for me. And then there was just not enough opportunity with them. They're just small. Sure. And it was a money thing. When I bailed on them two years ago for backcountry, it was like a 10 times more money thing. And they were like, dude, we get it. Go for it. And when backcountry chops all their athletes in three years, come on back. We'll have open arms for you. And like those guys are family to me. True is like I've traveled the world with them. I've lived with some of them. I've gone through shit with them. And I love those guys. And I, I just saw some true gear on the hill today. And I love the style and I, I miss riding for them. But it, it was just an opportunity thing. And they totally understood. But I really wish that those guys were able to grow it a little more and have more athlete influence and more athlete support. But there just wasn't enough of that. And those things, athlete influence is important and athlete support is necessary with these careers. The backcountry thing ended up being very short-lived as we all guessed that they would just clean house very quickly because they're the big evil empire in the ski industry. In a lot of ways, they're just like the Walmart of the ski industry. They hired a new CEO and they flipped the script and they are hiring a bunch of influencers, which I am not. I have a decent social following, but I'm not an influencer. I'm an athlete and I stand by that. So they offered me 25% of my contract rather than a little bit of an increase to cover inflation. And so I, lucky enough, found a great fit with Obermeyer, which is a hometown Aspen brand. They've been in Aspen since the 40s. And Klaus Obermeier is 100 plus years old, maybe 104. And he's still skiing. And I modeled Obermeier gear when I was four years old as a little toddler almost in Aspen. I've got some cute photos. My, my mom still got kicking around the house. And they're revamping some things and doing this like free ride collection next year called Off Grid. And I'm so pumped on it. I'm wearing the prototypes right now. And that's why I'm modifying them because I can go right into the office in Aspen go sit down with the designers, show them what I've done. And I, I just really think we can make some great things happen. So I'm, I'm so stoked to be back with the hometown brand right down the street and keep the dream alive. All right. So who else pays you to ski? Focal pays me. Zeal Optics is a little mini contract. Aspen Snowmass actually takes good care of me. And I love my relationship with Aspen Snowmass. It's such an easy thing to promote. The experience in Aspen is as good as it gets. In the U.S. anyways, Europe is a whole nother level. And I tell people that all the time, but Aspen puts it all together as well as anyone else in the U.S. It's, it's European in a way. It's got the opera. It's got the on-mountain dining. People are there just to have a good time. There's not the ego that there is in other ski areas. People aren't like trying to get it as hard. So there's stashes that last longer and the vibes are just so good. And the skiing, I tell people a lot, I'm up in Jackson right now and Jackson's east facing and the bottom part of the mountain's low elevation. The whole mountain is east facing. And my take on it is this place is epic a lot more often than Aspen is. And it's also terrible a lot more often than Aspen is. Aspen's like always good. Doesn't get a ton of snow, but it's north facing. It's high elevation. It stays chalky and cold and it's a good consistent pitch. So you just don't get this like frozen reef, 
gnarly rocky fucked up terrain it just is a a really great mountain to just go ski that's a great place to call home to me it is and it's interesting where when you think about skiers where they gravitate towards for like gnarly skiing it's like palisades is one place jackson is another place crested butte is another place and you never hear anybody really say anything about aspen but just listening to you i'm sure that you would put that right in your top three yeah but it's more of just like good skiing all the time it it is not as gnarly we do have the wall you know what i mean and it's sick and there are cliffs up there we have some sick terrain but otherwise it's just good pitches it's just good nice clean fun skiing you might not be able to get as much gnar as you can as you would if you come up to jackson but on a daily basis i don't need gnar i need just like hop on the gondola hang out with friends ski some beautiful groomers some nice chalky bumps on a daily basis i think it's kind of the best keeps you strong and happy and it's not a zoo man these other places are zoos it's this weekend here has been crazy bro like i was just stuck in traffic for like an hour every time i turned a corner i was like oh my god man and the lift lines the tram lines so aspen is a little bit harder to get to a little bit more exclusive and it's a really great place to call home i love it there it's so beautiful you know the other thing just to go on a little tangent is Everyone thinks that you're soft if you live in Aspen. You don't know about the backcountry or whatever. And I think if you ski the backcountry in Colorado, you're way gnarlier than if you ski the backcountry in Jackson or a lot of these places because we have to be so heads up because our snowpack is so touchy and not everyone is doing it. You actually are kind of not pioneering it, but you're setting the first track out there a lot of times. And it's super touchy and scary and you just got to be much more of a master to survive out there whereas jackson it's just like everyone skids moguls in the backcountry all right so we are going to stop talking shit on jackson for a moment and we will say that aspen is one of your sponsors and in the last part of my sponsor talk i like to talk about money too and when you think about on paper in a calendar year how much is the most you've ever made from skiing oh i don't know if i want to go down the numbers game but i could just kind of tell you that I don't make enough to be buying homes or anything like that. I even have summer jobs to help keep things coming along. But I do make enough to sustain my lifestyle and not have to work in the winter, which is crucial for me. So I can hop on an opportunity the second it comes up because they come up last second. And also the low overhead makes that money go a lot further. I have this Ford Bronco sponsorship right now, which comes with a free gas card. And then I don't pay for any of my ski gear and just kind of the list goes on there. And that makes my money go a lot further. All right. So now we're going to kind of get into when your career really kickstarts, because in 2012, you're staving up for the trip of a lifetime. You head to Haynes, Alaska, And you're going to heli-ski with Lexi DuPont, Leo Ahrens, Will Wisman, Reggie Christ. And how do you know this crew? Where do you meet these guys along the way? Well, Leo is a good buddy from Alta. Yep. We just skied together. He's in my phone still as Leo AFD, which is Alta Free Ride Development. Because when I first moved there at the age of 19 or 20, for some reason I gravitated towards skiing with the 15-year-olds because they were just the ones building jumps and hucking their meat. My peers were like a lot of people from the South that had just moved on like cool works and stuff like that. So I ended up skiing with these local younger kids and Sam O'Cohen is one of them and Leo is one of them. So that's how I knew them. And I'm not exactly sure how Lexi and I met. Might have been through a friend of ours, Jackie Edgley. We did go on a trip, but I don't know if that's when we met up to Canada. Anyways, we became close friends. I was kind of chasing her around. I thought she was cute. Still think she's cute. She's rad, but she's getting married. One that got away. And... I will never forget, I was in Smiley Creek, Idaho with Smith trying to get my foot in the door over there and and get a few shots at the old Smiley Creek jump zone. And Lexi called and was like, hey, we're in Alaska. We have an extra seat. It's going to cost you $3,000. You should come up. You and Leo should come up and we can film each other. And I was like, Lexi, that's going to break me. She said, no, it's not. It's going to make you. And for some reason, (laughs) I was like, you know what? She's right. And so I flew up there the next day with Leo and Leo had some sort of camera and Wisman was taking photos of us and Reggie was helping us film with whatever kind of camera he had and we were GoProing it and it was super fun to 
operate that way. Just three friends skiing with, I mean, Wisman's pseudo guide. He knows that place like the back of his hand and he's kind of coaching us through things. So is Reggie. I owe a lot of my career to Reggie. He would bring us to really sick stuff, sit us on the Barbie and be like, do you see anything? And Dr. Seuss was the one in particular where I was like, oh, I think I see a line. It goes like this. He's like, explain that to me one more time. Where's your slough going to go? It's going to go there. I'm going to go there. All right, that's good. That's how it goes. We'll bring you back tomorrow and you can ski it. I was like, I want to ski it now. He's like, we'll bring you back tomorrow. He did and it went well. And TGR was up there that season making a movie all about Alaska called The Dream Factory. And one reason or another, in their three attempts to get footage from Haynes, which you really need to have if you're making a ski movie about Alaska, because it's one of the meccas, they got skunked. It's challenging up there. And so they ended up being short on footage and using some of my footage, which that story goes a little deeper with Tim Durchy was up there with Chris Van Chetler, and I can't remember the third athlete, but Van Chetler ended up twisting his ankle. And everyone had been telling TGR, you got to film Coulter, he's sick. And when Ben Chetler twisted his ankle, Epstein, the producer, was like, all right, Coulter, you can come with us. We'll film you, but we're not going to put you in the movie. I'm like, that's fine. I'm coming. If you say I can come, I'm coming. And sure enough, I got two or three clips that day, and they combined their footage of me with my POVs and the stuff that Reggie shot. And I elbowed my way into my first TGR movie, and that was 13 years ago or something. You are kind of like an exception because when you think about how these movies are made, they're always made with sponsors' money buying the athlete in. But like you said, it was a challenging year in Haynes. They didn't have the shots and they had some shots of yours and they put you in. Can you think of any other exceptions that get in the movie without having a sponsor buy them in other than yourself? Absolutely, I can. It's something that's really cool about TGR. Like, yes, they need the sponsors to pay the production budget. It's a high production budget. I know what it is right now, and I'm, a, I'm like, wow, that's a lot. Because it takes a lot. you got to send filmers across the world and pay them every day to film people. I mean, you do that all winter long, and you're going to be looking at some high prices. But that being said, there's always a few exceptions. Last year, Maggie Boysen was filming with us in Wyoming. She just happened to be around. She happened to be in the field with us. We needed some female action, and she was slaying it. None of her sponsors lined up, but it didn't matter. She was sick. We loved her vibe and we wanted to work with her. So she was an exception. She made her way into the film. And in the back end of that, TGR will end up trying to get their sponsors to help or or to find her a sponsor that does a line. And so that's what happened with me. Line ended up buddying up with TGR for a handful of years, which I think was a, a great relationship. It, it shined a good light on Line in a big mountain way. Yeah, especially when they were coming out with the product that was meant for that when they really hadn't had it before, it seemed like. What's crazy is that you create a pro career in like the most ski bummiest way because you're like 26 years old at this point. Everything happens because of your self-funded Alaska trip. And then you get handed like a lottery ticket seat on a TGR shoot and they actually use your footage. But do you know they're going to use your footage or do you kind of come home from the trip? You're like, that was pretty cool. And that was a great trip. And then you find out in the fall or how does that all work out? Yeah, you you nailed it again. I didn't think that anything was really going to come of it, but I appreciated the opportunity. And they were like, we'll let you use the footage. And so I was stoked to see the footage at some point. And I was living in Hood River that summer with one of the owners of True. And I got a, a call from Josh Malachek. And he's like, hey, TGR wants to use your footage. And I can't remember exactly how the conversation went after that, but I ended up having to mail them some... I wonder if it was like my SD card of my GoPro footage or something like that. And I just remember taking a picture of like this letter, like addressed to TGR, like, holy crap, I'm actually going to be in the movie because I knew I was going to be in the movie at that point. And then they wanted me to come out to Jackson to film an interview, like a more higher production value interview to really splice me into the movie. And so that was a big moment for me as well. Just like, wow, I never thought this was actually going to happen. This is a dream come true. What's wild is like when a lot of people's ski careers are ending and their mid 20s, yours is just starting. And it's like this last trip that you went on that started your career, the Dream Factory trip, that was probably the last full on self funded trip that you've had for the past like 13 years, right? You've been filming and had sponsors pitching in on almost everything you've been doing since then. 
Yeah, probably. It's kind of funny though. I was still making not much back then. I had really small contract with Line and almost no contract with True, but it was enough to kickstart me, I guess. And it's, I, I was talking with someone just the other day about these contracts because we have travel budgets attached to our contracts, some of us. And I'm like, it doesn't matter to me, though. It's all of this money is going to the exact same place. I'm going skiing all winter long to as many cool places as I can, regardless of I'm not looking at like, well, I can't afford that because I'm out of my travel budget. Like it's coming out of my pocket half the time anyways. Luckily, a lot of the money that's going into my pocket is coming from ski brands as a salary. But again, that could be going towards buying houses and stuff, but it's not. It's keeping me skiing. It's not furthering my finances. Yeah. It's still a self-funded endeavor in a certain way, but my job is skiing. Kind of hard to wrap your head around, but makes sense to me. No, it's not really because it speaks to the passion that you have for loving skiing because most people, if they don't find any success in what they're trying to do by age 26, if they're trying to be a pro athlete, usually they kind of go to plan B, but it's like you never stopped kind of pushing the gas and trying to do stuff for skiing, whether it was to be pro or not. It was just like you were always focused on skiing and then everything kind of comes together right after you move to Aspen and then sure as shit, the next 10, 12 years, you've got a full on pro ski career that's still going and it's all because you love to ski and every penny you get, you're putting back into skiing because that's just like what you were born to do. That is the truth. And I feel like that's what companies are supposed to do. They're supposed to put money back into the company to keep it going, right? I mean, that's what you would anticipate them doing, but it doesn't always happen like that, especially with a lot of the big public ski companies. You happened to ski for one of those, and that really ended up hurting probably your earning potential, even though it seemed like a cool company to be with. Yeah, definitely. And the funny thing is that you're back on the exact same company, except for with like a different brand name now. I mean, the company that owns Line, I believe, owns Vocal as well. Yeah, they do, but I hear some of the inners of that, and it's they're run much differently. And Vocal's like a German company that's been around a hundred years, and the Germans just do it right. That and uh, my international team manager, who I'm actually on an, on a U.S. contract at the moment, but I've been under Shinka's wing for a handful of years now, and he does things right. He brings us on trips to develop skis. We sit around a round table, talk about it, make the sickest products. He pushes things in the right way. He believes in us, and he brings the team together, and we love each other, and it feels so much different than it felt with Line. It doesn't feel like nickel and diming it. It doesn't feel like a cool guy club. It feels like a family of people who love skiing and want to push the sport in the right direction. And that's what I want to be a part of more than anything. All right. Well, before we get too far along in this interview, because we're already really far, I'm going to have to cut a bunch of shit out that I don't want to cut out or not even ask. So I'm just going to skip through some notes, which is totally fine. But I've got a couple questions where I don't know the answers. A lot of these things I knew what you're going to say or I had a good idea of what was going to happen. But there are some things that are some stories that I need to get you to tell the full story. And I hear they're going to be stories worth hearing. And so when I say Revel Stoke Suey 6 and you not showing up until 8 p.m. Tell your eyes Suey 6. Okay, tell your eyes Suey 6. What's the story about not showing up until 8 p.m.? Dirty and I were talking about that yesterday. It was Dirty, Katrina, and Heather and I. It was like December, maybe Jan probably January in Colorado, really snowy period in Colorado. When it snows in Colorado, it gets real deep, real fast. It, we have really good snow quality. And it was my first time ever skiing into Bear Creek, which is off the backside of Telluride. And we skied one run of the sickest snow ever. And I'm like, holy shit, that was sick. How many more times can we do that? It's 145. We can get two more in there. So we went right back up, did it again. It was super sick again. Went right back up and we couldn't get up the high lift. We had missed it but we were on the same ridge looking down into Bear Creek. And I'm like, well, let's just drop in right here. We don't need to ski the same run. We'll just ski this one. And we didn't have any locals with us. And my crew was like, well, we don't know where the fuck that goes. And I'm like, well, look, there's two ski tracks. We're not going to find two dead people in the bottom of this run off of a 500 foot cliff. Let's just drop in. We'll be fine. And even if there is a cliff, we'll hike out if we have to, worst case scenario. And we drop in and it was so sick, super good, super deep. We get down 400 feet or something, and it starts feeling like, oh, man, there might actually be a cliff down there. And I was like, hold up, guys. I'll go down a little 
lower and confirm or deny and i skied down another 100 feet and saw the anchors on the rock wall and like damn it those guys did have a rope so we had to boot pack up out of the couloir and we had missed last lift so it was already getting dark by now so we had to boot pack up ended up only having to boot pack up a little ways kind of but it was pretty deep to get into another couloir that barely went but this one did go through so yeah we made it back to telluride with super good snow still falling from the sky late in the evening well into dark time of the day and i have zero regrets and i don't think any of them do as well but tim and i just yesterday i was looking into granite i was like what about right here can we drop in here he's like i don't know man we don't have time to do another suey six right now (laughs) so it's something we'll never forget how about the story of the slide pow surfing on aspen mountain yeah that's something i still reference as my closest call my own time actually being caught in an avalanche. I've had partners be caught in avalanches, but the only time I've ever been actually like picked up and moved by snow with zero control on my part was pow surfing during the pandemic, mid to late April, probably mid April, super big storm came through. We were pow surfing the day before having a great time. And there's this kind of premier run on the backside of Aspen. It's in their cat skiing terrain called McFarland's. And it's, killed some people before which is obviously terrible so it's a known scary slope but things had been stable the day before and we got out the next morning and it was cold and it was blue and i was like i'm doing it dude it's a perfect pow surf it's big and kind of steep it's not huge but it's doable but anyways i dropped in and the whole thing spider webbed on me and on skis i would have been able to zoom out of there no problem right it's not that big and i tried to do that on my pow surf I have footage of it. I've posted it online, but I hit the staunch wall, which is where the slab piece of the avalanche stops and it's the normal slope again. And it creates kind of a lip. Yep. And where I hit that staunch wall, the board went flying and I went flying and I landed in the fresh snow and the avalanche just came barreling down behind me, picked me up and moved me a few hundred feet. And I was buried. My head was above. But people think when you're buried neck deep, they're thinking that it's a five and a half foot deep thing, but you're laying sideways inevitably. And so, yeah, my mouth was above the snow and my hand was above the snow and I, my buddies were right on me. I would have been fine if I was buried, but it was, it was a scary moment for sure. I was able to dig myself out and get out of there. And and we kept pow surfing just on lesser, lesser angled slopes. And then I've read a quote of yours that said, Don't smoke till you put your boots on and don't drink till you take them off. Elaborate on that one. Is that just a way of life? Yeah, that's something that got passed down to me while I was in Alta. I think Mikey Ray passed it down. He's a legend up there in the canyon. And yeah, it was a smoke and weed reference. Because if you do smoke weed before you get your boots on, by the time you get to the hill, you you probably forgot your boots or something else because they don't call it dope for no reason, right? Yep. But I did used to smoke more weed. I don't as much anymore. I don't know. I've been enjoying the more clear-headed days, but I always did like it. It gave me a lot of inspiration, and and there's almost this sort of anxious energy that comes from it. And I I still like to dabble with stuff like that, or maybe even a little micro here and there in the mountains, I think can be a fun way to see things from a different perspective and get a little inspiration. And then the don't drink till you take them off, break that rule every once in a while as well. But, you know... People get hurt when they're drunk skiing, and that's a shitty way to end a season or a career because you're drunk. But at the same time, you know, having a few beers and skiing down can feel pretty good, too. And, you know, there's the closing parties. You're definitely not playing by those rules then. Totally. Well, we could go on and on, but we're not going to because it's time for inappropriate questions. And this is a segment where I get someone you know to ask three questions, and they can be anything. With this one, I didn't go ask a pro skier who you're best friends with who may have had his phone hacked to ask any questions. I was going to stay away from that totally, so I am. But I was able (laughs) to get a guy that you grew up with, a guy you lived with, and a guy that had you as his best man at his wedding, Brad Bell, to ask the inappropriate questions. And are you ready for question number one from Brad? I sure am. All right, let me cue it up for you right now, and here we go. (laughs) Colter, you are an icon on the Aspen ski scene. Dare I say, a sex symbol. You have a luscious head of hair. I don't care what anybody says. Do you have a regular barber? And what would you say is your favorite haircut you've ever had? (laughs) Well, he's throwing me under the bus because you know how it goes when your dad's got 
male pattern baldness, you've got a little bit of it going on as well. So, yeah, it's been, you know, just a slow receder going on there. So I just cover it with a hat and everything is just fine by me. So my favorite haircut is the one where I get to wear a hat after. And it's funny, I've actually have not gotten my hair cut by a barber in like 10 years. I've always got like a friend cut it. And I, I have this thing where I like getting my hair cut like in an epic spot. So I've always got a pair of scissors packing with me and I like to just kind of keep it pretty loose and shaggy and, you know, never high and tight. Cause that kind of just accentuates the receder as Patty Graham calls it. When it recedes too much, are you going to pull the shave or are you just going to try to milk it for as long as you can? I think I can milk it forever. It's not that bad. Okay. It's funny though. I do pick my jobs in the summer accordingly. I don't want to work at a restaurant where I can't wear a hat. I like having a hat on anyways. I need to have a bill for the sunshine in my face. And it's a style thing anyways, right? Yep. All right. Well, that's question number one. We'll jump into question number two. Aspen sorely misses its best locals bar, the Red Onion. It was an institution for many years, a gathering place for the ski community, and one of the last great watering holes in town. You had an illustrious career there as the head bartender. Did you ever get fired for any reason? (laughs) <laughs> All right. You mentioned you got fired, but you can tell us what happened to get you fired. I got fired from that place a handful of times. And part of it, I chalk up to just restaurants have a timeline <laughs> for me anyways, before you start getting fed up and snappy with people. But the main reasons I got canned the time I, I mentioned it, we would rage in there. And, you know, I was like 24 in charge of a bar It was open till two in the morning where it was all locals and I was allowed to drink and I would. We would just party and we were spraying champagne on the ceilings. Brad Smith, the manager that fired me and sent me to AK, he still tells me there's still champagne stains on the silver ceiling in there. So one night in particular, we were just raging, spraying champagne on the ceiling. I had a dog back behind the bar with me helping me bartend, like literally like a a four legged furry dog was hanging out in the back of the bar with me. We just had so much fun in there. I love those days. There's no regrets. And Brad was never mad at me for being, you know, an asshole. It was more just like, you're got out of line again, kid. Yeah. And I remember that morning being on the gondola, Brad Smith calls. And this would happen a lot. Uh Uh-oh, why is Brad Smith calling? Did I fuck up last night? I can't even remember closing. Hey, Brad, what's up? Act all cool. (laughs) (laughs) And he's like, what the hell happened in here last night? And I was like, uh, I don't know. What do you mean? Well, the money wasn't in the safe. There's a broken cabinet upstairs and there's a dog turd in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, we got a little out of control. And I think that it's legendary stuff that we'll never forget. Awesome, man. Here's your final inappropriate question. Aspen has always been an inclusive and welcoming community. Do you enjoy wearing dresses from time to time? That one's not as juicy as the other ones. That's just a uh, fantasy football reference. You lost your league? Yeah, I lost the league. Yeah, and it's it's a fun league with my old boss, Brad Smith, who I was talking about, and Brad Ungler, and a whole bunch of the Flying Monkeys are in it. And I've lost a few times. I've also come close to winning, but one of our buddies, Jay-Z, has won seven out of the last 10 years. It's driving us nuts, but that's our rule. You either have to wear a dress to the draft or you have to buy the whole tab. So I've opted on the cheaper side and worn a dress twice now. And I, I quite enjoy it, to be honest. All right. Well, that is not the most inappropriate of questions, but thinking of you being a bartender at the Red Onion, it makes me think of two different things. So I'm just going to throw two more in there because why not? So the first one I think about is Aspen's a rich town, given that it's a locals bar, but I'm sure other people stumble in as well. How much is like the most that you would make on a good night? And what's the biggest tip you've ever received in Aspen? Well, bear in mind, I haven't been there in eight years now behind the bar of the Red Onion and the Red Onion is defunct now which is a shame. But I remember during that heyday when I was 24 years old, manning the bar by myself, I would walk home with a wad of like five to $800 most nights, which was absurd amount of money for that age and that time period. And it was all cash in my pocket. And I just partied the whole night before to get it. That was pretty sick. But servers and bartenders in Aspen, $500,000 a night is not uncommon, which is a pretty nice chunk of change. And It's a fun way to make money. So that's why I still do it in the summer. And then with being a bartender in a town like Aspen, do cougars come hunting? And like for a dude like you who is 24, you're on the cover of Powder Magazine, 
you're bartending, you're drinking at the bar, you're living the life. You have this lifestyle that every, it's almost like a movie character before you're even like a real pro skier at that point. You just are like the man, it seems like. And does that come with benefits? Yeah, I've always done all right in that area, but I've never gone up the ladder. I always go down for the physical reasons you're thinking of maybe. But I have a really good friend, Austin, who dated one of my good buddy's moms, <laughs> uh, or my good buddy's mother-in-law now and his wife's mother. And, and she's awesome. Suze, I love you if you're listening to this. Yeah, so that's been around and it's a very funny and awesome thing. When it goes down, it's a crack up when your buddy's dating someone who's 20, 30 years older than him and she's got a fat stack of cash and helping keep our dream alive. That's amazing. So that's Inappropriate Questions and that's the podcast. And your story is so awesome because it really didn't become a story until you're in your mid-20s. And I've had Elise Sogstad on the podcast and Nick McNutt on the podcast. Both of them kind of started their careers through the TGR collab contest. And while you did that, you were already kind of a pro at that point. But the way that you became pro was even harder. It was like being at the right place at the right time in the world, holding your own with the best skiers in the world, and then having this company who didn't get paid to put you in the movie put you in the movie because they needed your footage. And then from there on, you became part of this elite crew that's been making movies for like 15 years since then. And it's like the Aspen ski bum dream. It's a cool story. Thank you for sharing it. And thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm stoked to be on there and stoked to share the story. And it's, it's fun uh, having you dig it all back up because I forgot some of these juicy details. So I appreciate it, Mike. So that was Coulter Hinchliff. And I love the fact that Coulter was a ski bum living the dream. But before that dream even happened, Coulter was living it up, tending bar at night and up early every day to shred. It's the lifestyle a lot of us dream about at one point in life. And even cooler than that is the fact that culture made the other lifestyle that we all dream about at some point in life happen. And his life as a pro skier, traveling the world has been going on for over a decade. The moral of the story, at least for Coulter, is don't let the dream die and it just may happen. That's the show. At this point, I want to thank you for listening and ask you to tell your friends about the show. It really does help things grow. Finally, please support the brands that make this show happen. They are Outdoor Research, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Best Day Brewing, Elon Skis, and Stanley. Have a great week, everyone.